Welcome back to Reliving the War. This time we're going to compare the November 6th, 1995 episodes of WWF Raw and WCW Nitro to see which show was the best. I think you guys know how this all works by now, but for a quick reminder, both shows are played at the same time and I score points on each segment. Whoever ends up with the most points is the winner. Nitro is live this week from Jacksonville, Florida, while the WWF is still presenting their Manitoba tapings. WCW is still reeling from the Halloween Havoc 1995 pay-per-view, where the Giant defeated Hulk Hogan by disqualification, and even though Hogan lost via DQ, the Giant was claiming that he was the WCW champion. The WWF guys are still promoting the 1995 Survivor Series, an event that will feature a wild card Survivor Series match that will force heels and babyfaces to team up together, and also with the Survivor Series, Bret Hart will get a WWF Championship match against Big Daddy Cool Diesel. To kick things off, we have matches on both shows. WCW gives us The Giant vs Cobra, while WWF Raw presents Marty Jannetty vs Davey Boy Smith. Let's stick with Raw then. If you remember back to last week, Jannetty cleared out the ring during Jim Cornette's excellent promo, so we'll see if Davey Boy can get a little revenge here. Doc Hendricks is filling in for Jerry Lawler at the commentary desk. Jerry will have his hands full in this evening's main event when he and Isaac Yankum take on Bret Hart and Hakushi. The Jannetty and Bulldog match gets underway then and the beginning of the match has some snappy, fast paced action. Something you'll notice when watching these taped episodes of Raw though is that the audience progressively gets more burnt out as the tapings go on. By the third or fourth taping, there's definitely a lack of natural noise, but anyway, the match starts off with Davey and Marty throwing each other around the ring. Things are going okay. Around a minute in, we see Clarence Mason, and Clarence has managed to get Davey Boy Smith a WWF title match at December's In Your House pay-per-view. The British Bulldog will face either Bret Hart or Diesel in the last pay-per-view event of 1995. So yeah, good job Clarence. As the match progresses, it's evident that Marty Jannetty is trying to keep things at a fast pace, but I don't think Davy Boy was really up to it. I counted five chin locks during this entire match, all of which were applied by the British Bulldog. Going back to the same hold five times in any match is bad enough, but it's even worse on a 60 minute Raw broadcast, where ring time is limited enough as it is. With that being said, the action was still good when both men were on their feet. Marty gets a chance to show off some of his unique offense, but in the end, Davy Boy gets the win with a running power slam. This would have been an excellent opener if not for the chin locks. After the match, a Bill Clinton impersonator tells us that he will be attending the Survivor Series pay-per-view, and this is weird because Vince McMahon would act like this was the real Bill Clinton. To be fair though, the guy did look like the former President of the United States. Over to WCW Nitro and Eric Bischoff kicks things off by letting us know that we, the fans, can dial a premium phone number in order to decide tonight's main event. Fans can choose someone from the red locker room to face someone from the blue locker room. The red heel locker room features options such as Ric Flair, Diamond Dallas Page, The Shark and Big Bubba, while the blue babyface locker room has guys like Johnny B. Bad, Sting, Alex Wright and Mr. JL. I don't want to say this was fixed, but at the same time, Time, I'm pretty sure Eric Bischoff knew that fans would vote for Sting vs Flair, but anyway. We are shown clips from Halloween Havoc. I had seriously hoped we were done with this pay per view, but no. The focus is put on Lex Luger turning on Randy Savage. Bischoff says that Savage is still injured from the devastating torture rack that was applied by the total package, but Randy is in the building tonight for Nitro and he wants to get his hands on Luger. Cobra makes his way down to the ring. Who was Cobra, I hear you ask? Well, it's Jeff Farmer. Not this Jeff Farmer. Yep. But this Jeff Farmer. 
Jeff would ditch the Cobra gimmick when WCW needed a fake sting in 1996, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. We've got months and months to go before we get there. Anyway, the Giant picks up ring announcer Dave Panzer, forcing him to announce that this is a WCW championship match, and it's over in 10 seconds. Chokeslam, 1, 2, 3. Complete and total squash match. To fill the time, we see the red and blue locker rooms, and it looks like the white powder was definitely of top quality in the babyface locker room. I mean, it looks like an unhinged party in there. In the heel locker room, Bobby Eaton and Steve Regal couldn't care less. They just want to drink tea and read a book. Fantastic. The first point goes to Raw. There may have been a reliance on rest holds here, but at least they worked an actual wrestling match. That babyface locker room sure looked like a whole lot of fun, but still, Raw takes the early lead. WCW is giving us a promo from Venice Beach featuring Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage along with a match, The Taskmaster vs The Renegade, while WWF Raw will bring us a post-match interview with Jim Cornette and a backstage promo featuring Bret Hart, Barry Horowitz and Hakushi. On Raw, Jim Cornette is happy with the result in the ring and the result in the boardroom. Clarence Mason done his job and got Davey Boy Smith his rightful title match at In Your House in December. You can't help but think that Jim is talking from the heart when he addresses the wildcard match at Survivor Series and calls it foolish, going on to tell Shawn Michaels that if he double crosses Davey in that wildcard bout, then Shawn's little incident in Syracuse will feel like a walk in the park. Davey talks a little about the December in your house title match and he trips over his words a little, that Marty Jannetty match seemingly took it out of the British Bulldog. All in all, a decent promo. It's also hard not to notice this anti-WCW sign in the audience. We go over to Brad Hart, Horowitz and Hakushi backstage and Brad is trying his best to communicate with Hakushi, telling his partner that they will be number one later in the evening. Over on Nitro, we go to Venice Beach and the Hulkster has managed to bring Randy Savage over to the dark side. Savage is dressed in black just like Hogan and now the evil mega powers are coming after the Dungeon of Doom. Two things here, Hogan and Savage are hanging out with this homeless guy and also there's a complete moon cat here playing guitar while wearing rollerblades. This is completely insane. The homeless guy is making random noises throughout the promo. Savage says he will travel to WCW Nitro to see who are the friends and who are the foes of Hulk Hogan. And yeah, I don't know what to say here. Back in the arena, the Taskmaster takes on the Renegade. The match goes on for around two and a half minutes and it really lacks heat. Jimmy Hart constantly reminds the Renegade that he's no Hulk Hogan. And after Kevin Sullivan predictably wins the match, Jimmy Hart rubs the face paint off the Renegade's face, telling him he is nothing and he's just Rick, while reminding him that his career is over. A little harrowing in hindsight when we think about how Rick Wilson's downward spiral in wrestling also led to a downward spiral in his own real life. The in-ring action also was sloppy here. This felt like a mismatch from the opening bell. The bumps look a little awkward and Kevin Sullivan didn't give the Renegade much here. It was all about the Taskmaster and Jimmy Hart. Another point for Raw. I found Jim Cornette's mastery of the microphone much more entertaining to watch here. The Savage and Hogan promo was batshit crazy and the Sullivan match was too predictable and honestly, it felt like a waste of television time. After the match, we see Mean Gene Okerlund in the heel locker room and someone managed to hit the light switch during the segment. Beautiful. Up next, WCW gives us another Chris Benoit vs Eddie Guerrero match, while the WWF gives us Henry O. Godwin vs Terry Richards. Who is Terry Richards? Why, it's none other than Rhino. And what's interesting here is the fact that Rhino had been working for WCW just two weeks prior to this match on Raw here. His final WCW appearance was a loss to Road Warrior Hawk on WCW Worldwide, happening on September 24th, 1995. Anyway, Henry Godwin had been having some issues with Hunter Hearst Helmsley over on Superstars for a few weeks, and Henry would face Hunter next week on Raw, so this match with Terry Richards was used to promote next week's bout. Richards gets in around two offensive moves to start things off and the rest of the match is all Henry Godwin. And I'm not sure people want to see a match that's all Henry Godwin. 
Two minutes of action here, Henry destroys the future Rhino, scoring a pinfall win after delivering the slop drop. We get some form of entertainment afterwards when Hunter Hearst Helmsley hits Godwin with a pedigree on the outside of the ring, and then the cerebral assassin pours some slop on the hog farmer. Benoit vs Guerrero over on Nitro there weren't many guys during this era who could have repetitive matches on TV without burning out the viewing audience, but Benoit and Guerrero were so good during this time period that every match had you on the edge of your seat. That being said, Benoit and Guerrero's first singles bout on Nitro was a little rough around the edges, so let's see if they could fine tune their match here. As Benoit takes control early in the match, Eric Bischoff reminds us that the WCW committee are still discussing the possibility of a WCW cruiser division and a cruiserweight championship and we should have more news in the weeks that follow. Benoit continues with some explosive offense as the cameras show us a table filled with Japanese superstars. Remember that last week Bobby Heenan was seen making some sort of deal with Sonny Ono so Bobby had something to do with this table full of Japanese superstars such as Masahiro Chono and Jushin Lager. Back in the ring and the match is still all Benoit, Eddie is fighting this one from underneath and I'll be honest here, I prefer when both men are booked into a more equal playing field. I understand the need to get Benoit ready for his upcoming addition to the Four Horsemen stable, but I also selfishly enjoy watching Eddie Guerrero showing off his hybrid moveset. Eddie didn't get much offense in during this match, but what he did get in was still good, and Benoit's moveset had such high impact and intensity that you just didn't want to take your eyes away from the screen whenever he was in the ring. In particular, this superplex and this powerbomb both looked pretty intense. Benoit tries to suplex Guerrero into the ring, but Eddie is able to reverse in mid-air. Eddie pins Benoit and gets the 1-2-3, but Benoit's foot is outside of the ring. The ref's decision is final. Benoit complains, and the match is over. A good match here. While I preferred their previous match from two weeks ago, this one was still pretty smooth, and both men had great timing here. Nitro gets the point. We get the Survivor Series Slam Jam update next on Raw. Todd Pettengill lets us know that The Undertaker is coming back to lead a Survivor Series team in two weeks time. And Taker fans will know here that the Deadman Survivor Series squad consists of Bone Street crew members. We then get a clip of Paul Bearer and The Undertaker. The Undertaker's gruesome, deformed face is played up here and fans would need to buy the Survivor Series to get a proper look at The Undertaker's face. Big Daddy Cool Diesel addresses Bret Hart in the Survivor Series main event, and while this was going on, Nitro gave us another look at the WCW Babyface locker room, and they presented a Slim Jim commercial. Nitro then brings us their main event for the evening, the Stinger is going to take on Ric Flair as voted by WCW fans. The WWF presents their semi main event during this same time slot, Tony Roy is going to go to battle with Kama. So the Slam Jam update and the Kama match is going up against Sting vs Ric Flair. Eric Bischoff tells us that Sting and Flair won the vote, but we don't get any numbers to back it up. If it was a legitimate vote, it would have been nice to see what margins both Sting and Ric Flair won by, but anyway, this is a great match to put on Nitro for free. Sting and Flair had a superb story going into this match, so let's see if they could capitalize. Sting starts the match totally pissed off, attacking the Nature Boy before Rick could even step into the ring. The Stinger shows great fire early in the match as the nature boy tries to plead his case but Sting keeps going full throttle. The fight spills to the outside and the nature boy gets a breather when Sting misses a scorpion splash against the guardrails. We go to commercial break, an advertisement runs for the first ever WCW World War 3 pay per view and Flair is in the driver's seat whenever we come back. The nature boy locks in the figure 4 leg lock while using the bottom rope for leverage and when Sting defiantly fires up and begins pounding his chest while locked in Flair's signature move, the audience goes absolutely nuts. So, so good. Flair and Sting had chemistry to spare and it really shows during this match. Sting no-sells a bunch of Flair chops, but Flair is able to turn things around once again with a poke to the eye. The next few minutes are all nature boy as the dirtiest player in the game lives up to his name. Flair hits Sting with some brass knucks and goes for the pin, but the Stinger still kicks out. Not 
nothing is stopping the man called Sting here in his quest to destroy the nature boy. Sting puts Flair in the scorpion death lock. Flair submits, but the Stinger won't release the hold after the bell. WCW officials and babyface wrestlers try to reason with Sting, but he refuses to let go. Eventually, the hold is broken, only for Sting to go right back and reapply the scorpion death lock. Lex Luger then comes out, he says something to Sting, and Sting just lets go of the death lock. Sting leaves the ring with the evil Lex Luger, as the commentary team wonder what Lex just said to the man called Sting. Nitro just put on a great match. Can the aforementioned Survivor Series Slam Jam and Kama vs Tony Roy put up a fight here? Short answer, no. As Kama makes his way to the ring, Barry Dudinsky is back, trying to sell us more WWF merchandise. Remember last week when I said Barry must be hiding the good shit in his jacket? Well, guess what? Barry reveals the good stuff this week on Raw, folks. Barry is selling a bag of pogs. No joke, 1,000 pogs and two slammers for $21. We have gone from cardboard cutouts to foam championship belts to pogs. I'm sure there's collectors out there who are still into pogs and madcaps and all that stuff. Maybe a few of these are worth money nowadays, but anyway, on with the match. Tony Roy actually gets the upper hand in the opening moments of the bout, but Kama turns things around as expected. And out of nowhere, we have Shawn Michaels phoning in to Raw. Shawn phones in to say he's back in action and he's looking forward to making his television return at the Survivor Series show. The action in the ring was playing second fiddle here to the heartbreak kid. The phone call lasted just as long as the wrestling match, Kama gets the win after destroying Tony Roy throughout most of the match, and Raw loses the point. I'm not sure anyone could have toppled Sting and Flair on this night to be honest, Kama and Tony Roy didn't stand a chance. Raw presents its final match next. Isaac Yankum and Jerry Lawler vs Bret Hart and Hakushi. And over on Nitro, we have a Dungeon of Doom promo. Let's stick with Raw. Bret Hart and Hakushi had been rivals earlier in the year, and now the two men were teaming up to take on Jerry Lawler and his royal dentist. If I'm honest, the whole Jerry Lawler vs Bret Hart feud never did interest me all that much when I was younger, and I thought that I'd maybe appreciate it more as I got older, but that's not the case. I think the problem here is that Jerry Lawler did not wrestle the same way in the WWF as what he did in Memphis. Jerry truly was a king in the old Memphis territory, and here in the WWF, he wrestled like a sniveling and scared heel. And many fans only know this WWF Jerry Lawler and not the Lawler from the 70s and 80s. Anyway, Brad and Hakushi are able to work pretty well together, even displaying some double team moves early in the match. The babyfaces totally dominate the early portion of the match, which is a little jarring. Brett even attacks Isaac Yankum behind the referee's back, so the script was kind of flipped here, as Isaac Yankum takes an absolute beating. Hakushi though slips up, allowing the royal dentist to grab him and drill him into the ring post to finally swing things around. Jerry Lawler gets tagged in, he nails his trademark pile driver on Hakushi, but the king doesn't go for the pin. Lawler hits another pile driver, and again, no pin attempt is made afterwards. It's so odd, but anyway, the match turns into what you would expect. Hakushi needs to make a tag to the hitman. Brett eventually gets tagged in, the crowd comes alive as the excellence of execution begins beating up both of his opponents, and Isaac Yankum finds himself locked in the sharpshooter. Jerry Lawler grabs a plastic chair. Barry Horowitz runs into the ring to get the chair away from Lawler, but the referee sees Horowitz holding the chair and he calls for the bell. Isaac Yankum and Jerry Lawler win via disqualification. A poor finish to the match here. Things were going quite well and what we got was okay, but the DQ finish was a letdown. The chair wasn't even used and still the referee threw the match out. The Raw broadcast ends with Vince McMahon and Doc Hendricks running through next week's matches. 
Over on Nitro, Main Jane is in the ring with the giant Kevin Sullivan and Jimmy Hart. We are going to get some answers here in regards to the WCW Championship. It took WCW a whole two weeks to come up with this one, folks, so let's see what happens. Jimmy Hart says that while Hulk Hogan was filming movies that would end up in a video store and not on the big screen, Jimmy himself had power of attorney when it came to Hulk's WCW dealings. This means that Jimmy was signing Hulk Hogan's match contracts and agreeing to stipulations. Jimmy reveals that he signed Hulk Hogan's Halloween Havoc contract and a stipulation in that very contract stated that if Hulk Hogan lost by disqualification, then the Hulkster would also lose the WCW Championship. Why this wasn't revealed last week on Nitro is a complete mystery. A WCW attorney then gets in the ring and this attorney says that due to the Dungeon of Doom's sneaky actions at Halloween Havoc, the WCW committee has decided that the title belt would get vacated. So match contracts mean absolutely nothing in WCW it seems. Why bother having Jimmy Hart explain that he and the Dungeon of Doom got one over on Hulk Hogan if you're just going to completely nullify the contract? The attorney says that the winner of the 60 man World War 3 Battle Royal would become the new WCW champion. The giant doesn't want to hand over the WCW belt but Kevin Sullivan ends up handing it over for him saying the giant will just win the 60 man Battle Royal anyway. Nitro goes off the air as Eric Bischoff reveals a few matches going down next week. Raw gets the final point. Vacating a world championship is a big deal and Jimmy Hart was pretty good here and even though the end of the Bret Hart match was questionable it was still better than Nitro's final 10 minutes or so. Now, I could have sworn Eric said at the top of the show that Macho Man Randy Savage was in the building and he was coming after Luger. I went back to the start of the show and yes, the commentators say that Macho was going nuts backstage, but Savage was nowhere to be seen on this episode of Nitro. We did see him chilling out at Venice Beach, but he didn't make an appearance in the ring. After looking into next week's shows, it turns out that WC CW taped their next episode of Nitro, so Savage was indeed in the building here but he would only make an appearance on next week's taped broadcast. Still, if you tuned into Nitro on this evening, you would have fully expected to see the Macho Man make a live appearance by the way Eric Bischoff was talking. It was a dick move for sure. So Raw scored the first point with the British Bulldog vs Marty Jannetty match. Jim Cornette scored Raw another point thanks to his mic work while WCW gave us a rather poor Taskmaster vs Renegade match. Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit delivered the goods once again to give Nitro its first point of the evening. And afterwards, Sting and Ric Flair gave us the match of the week while Shawn Michaels phoned into Raw while a match played in the background. Finally, the Raw main event had a questionable finish but I still thought it was a better viewing experience than the Dungeon of Doom promo. Raw gets its second win here on Reliving the War, meaning our overall scores are now 2 points for Raw, 5 points for Nitro and we have had 2 ties. In the weekly television ratings, Raw got the win, scoring a 2.6 while Nitro managed a 2. Thanks for watching and supporting the Reliving the War show. Remember to check out the Reliving the War podcast and join me next week when Sting takes on Dean Malenko, Randy Savage goes one on one with Meng, Hunter Hearst Helmsley squares off with Henry Godwin and Razor Ramon defends the IC Championship against Psycho Sid.